Hey, directors. Time to get off your high horse. It's time for Hollywood Grump. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Hollywood Grump. I am the Grump, a.k.a. the old curmudgeon, a.k.a. the Krusty Krab, a.k.a. Get off my lawn, you little bastards! Here on Hollywood Grump, we talk about everything from new and vintage gear, including testing and reviews, to surviving the business of Hollywood, to stuff that just irritates me. All through the lens of a man so irritable that I said, get off my lawn! It is raining cats and dogs outside in LA today, so you might see the light changing uh, throughout the video. If that happens, tough shit. Suck it up. For all you gear nerds out there, today's episode is shot on a Canon FD 28mm f2.8, adapted to micro four thirds. In my opinion, an amazing, warm, vintage piece of glass that takes the digital edge off modern cameras for video and stills, if you're into such things. Plus, it's built the way that all lenses of that era were built, like a frickin' bulldozer. I got mine for under 100 bucks on eBay. If you can find one for around that price, I highly recommend picking one up. Let me know in the comments below how you think this lens looks, and remember, it's not the lens's fault, I've got a face for radio. It's horrible. No, God, and a voice for print. No. Sounds like he's choking on hard mode. Someone get him the hell no. I'm a director. I started off in advertising as a print art director, then moved up to be a broadcast art director, concepting commercials and so forth, then a broadcast producer, and then finally a director. So trust me when I tell you, I know how much this next segment gonna hurt. I know. Every aspiring filmmaker has the perception of what a director is. Years of watching movie scenes of something being shot gave us this idea that directors were the big shot. They were in charge of everything, ruling with an iron fist. We have visions of one day sitting in one of those cool ass chairs, ordering up a latte, a foamy one, and then shooting a nasty glare at the person who brought it to you because they forgot to sprinkle cinnamon on top. Ah yes, being a director means you are the big man on campus. The HMFIC, the top dog ordering people around, whose every whim is catered to with double time alacrity. Um, yeah, not even close. No big shot directors to be, this is not remotely the case. You are not the most important person on set. In fact, in my opinion, you're tied for third, and that's being generous. Before we get down to the bullocks of this, let me just say that this ranking system doesn't really apply to fully independent, fully self-financed projects. If you wrote, produced, financed, and are planning on directing a project, this probably doesn't really apply to you. Or at least not fully. More on that later. I'm talking about commercial and or film production, where you have an average sized crew, a producer that isn't you, a client paying for the whole shebang, and a million other moving parts. Despite what you've learned about directing from watching movies, on shoot day, you are way down the list. Now, before you start feeling sad and down about your demotion, just stay tuned to the end of the segment. Also, I plan on doing an entire in-depth series about what each person does on a production, why they're important, why there are so many of them, and why they cost so damn much. Hopefully, it'll be educational. So subscribe to be notified when that series is up and running. So here we go. First on the list, your executive producer slash client. On a commercial production, you'll likely have both. Your client is the company or brand that has hired you to direct the spot and is usually paying for the whole kit and caboodle. On a commercial, feature, or short film, the executive producer is in charge of making sure the client or studio's vision for the project is realized. They often too hold the purse strings. No matter what grand vision you have for any production, you have to get it approved through these people. Make no mistake about it, you work for them. This holds true for anyone below superstar status. Until you reach the J.J. Abrams, Steven Spielberg, Catherine Bigelow directordom, you will be answering to these people, and you'll do so with a smile. You may get lucky, as I have on many occasions, to actually work with an EP or a client that really is a partner through the whole thing, that trusts what you want to do and kind of lets you go about doing it. But that's usually after you've worked together a few times before and you've formed a mutual trust. And it is certainly the exception and not the rule. So get some chapstick, pucker up, and get ready for some pro-level butt kissing. Second on the list, and I cannot stress this enough, is your director of photography. 
sometimes referred to as your cinematographer. A DP, in my educated opinion, easily ranks above a director on shoot day. In fact, this is one of those crew positions that I think actually applies to even independent films, as I mentioned before. A director of photography can make or break your entire production. No matter what your vision of the project is, the DP is the person who brings it to life. Period, end of sentence. For me in particular, as is the case with most directors, the DP is the very first crew member you hire for any production. I've been lucky enough to work with some of the best cinematographers in the business, and even luckier to have nurtured really good relationships with them. They're like family to me, because when you're working on a production, for a commercial you're spending days together, for anything longer than that, weeks or even months together. As much as possible, I try to work with the same two to three cinematographers on every single thing I shoot. Some people would say that that would make your work look stagnant, stale, look the same. A really good cinematographer knows how to make it look different. If you're fortunate, you can form a tremendous bond with your DP, which is great because that means you sort of know what each other wants without having to say it. You know, it's sort of the old saying that we finish each other's sentences. It's actually true. If you work with a DP long enough, you know what each other want or need and what they bring to the table. On the most basic visceral level, this person knows everything about the camera, lenses, and lighting that you're gonna be using on your production. They are masters at exposure, camera angles, lighting tricks, and everything else involved in getting that image onto your sensor or film. Which means you don't have to be. Whatever ideas you have planned for your shoot, a good DP will always make it 200% better. Trust me when I tell you, if your DP tells you you should try this, that, or the other thing, shut up and listen. I hate to break it to you, but for all but the most dialogue intensive, action crucial shots, you could drop dead on the set and the DP could finish the job, without question. As I said, I will explain more about that at the end of the segment. Third on the list and very close behind the director of photography is your first assistant director. I can tell you without a moment's pause that I or any other director worth of salt could not survive without their first AD. Commercial and film sets have a million moving parts all the time. Crew, actors, meals, catering, load-ins, load-outs, sometimes vehicles, sometimes animals, and the list goes on and on. There's only one person on set that can keep all those moving parts marching in line and that's your first assistant director. The first AD makes sure everything is where it needs to be exactly when it needs to be there. They coordinate your call times. That's the time where cast and crew and anyone else needs to show up to the set and dictate what all of those people should be doing at any given time. They coordinate when your talent needs to be in wardrobe, when they need to get in makeup, when makeup time needs to be over. They help work out blocking for scenes, create your shot list and schedule for maximum productivity and minimum wasted time. They help cue the background talent if you have background talent going on. They also usually instruct the background talent on what they're supposed to be doing so the director doesn't have to worry about that. They act as a go-between for you and your executive producer or client. In my case, for my favorite first AD and who I consider to be the best of all time, they ensure that the director is fed, hydrated, and generally just doesn't drop dead on the set. On many occasions, my first AD has called action and cut when my otherwise occupied brain has neglected to do so. A good first AD can act as a second unit director, shooting B-roll, interstitial scenes, stuff like that. And if you're uber lucky, as I have been, they also act as a confidant, a friend, and a gut-busting comic relief to help keep the mood on the set exactly where it needs to be. They are the second crew hire I make directly behind the cinematographer. A bad first AD can destroy your entire shoot day. A good one keeps all of those parts moving like clockwork. A great one 100% makes you a better director, or at least appear that way. Make no mistake, on shoot day, the first AD is far more important than you. I'm sure by now your inflated director egos are leaking air. You may feel sad or disillusioned. You might even feel angry. Maybe you want to take a swing at me. Well, go ahead and give it your best shot. Punk. But as promised, I will explain why this ranking order is so, and why I keep mentioning the caveat on shoot day. This is not an exercise in knocking directors off their pedestal, although God knows a few of them need that. This is instead a conversation about preparation. 
For most productions, by the time you arrive on set, you as the director have been working for weeks, in the case of commercial production, or months, even years, if you're talking about feature films. You have dreamt about every shot. You have memorized and reworked and rewritten at least part of the script. You've gone through countless iterations of storyboards. You maybe have even created some of your own storyboards. You have worked with your DP on the lens selection, the lighting look, the point of view from which this whole story will be told. You've worked with your first AD on technical challenges, location scouts, possible additional crew that might be needed, special needs for any of your cast. You've worked with your client and or EP on casting, visual direction, continuity, and so on. By the time you call action for the first time on the first shoot day, you've already directed the entire piece about a dozen times in your head. So on shoot day, these people that I've mentioned in the list are far more important than you. But every day leading up to that, you are definitely the most important person. You're making the decisions, you're creating the vision, you're deciding who the right people are to work on this production, and set aside the people that you work for, the executive producer or the client, it's your show. And you have a ton of responsibility, wardrobe, casting, locations, all of that stuff that you probably already know about. You've been working on that all the way up to shoot day. So to that end, take your preparation seriously. Do the groundwork, live the project, night and day, live it. Because regardless of the talent and expertise of the people I mentioned before, the last thing you want is a complete lack of direction once the production begins. Nothing fucks up a shoot like aimlessness. Making really important decisions on shoot day will immediately derail the entire project. If you show up confident with all your decisions, the cast, the crew, the client, the EP, everyone has faith in you. They will all get behind you. But the minute you start to hem and haw and, I don't know, let's see how this looks and let's try it this way, show up 100% prepared. This brings me to a side issue that I have with actors who show up on set and don't have their lines memorized. Show up prepared or don't show up. The only way to achieve this confidence with everyone involved is to do the legwork. Then let your trusted crew use all their talent to make the magic happen. On shoot day, let their expertise take all the weight off your shoulders. If it makes you feel any better, you can still tell your mom that you're the most important person on the set. I'm sure she already believes that anyway. I recently bought a teleprompter. It was a complete failure, which brings me to a subject in my top five grump-inducing things. Gear that does not work as advertised. This son of a bitch just plain did not work like it was supposed to. Now, most of you are saying in today's one day shipping world, just send it back and get a different one. And for most things, that's true. But when you're talking about cinema equipment, a lot of the equipment you buy is non-returnable, which is actually a good thing, because otherwise people would buy something for their shoot, use it for a day, send it back, and then the retailers would foist a price hike on us to cover the expense. I'm not talking about something that is broken or missing a piece or blah, blah, blah. That stuff you can return. I'm talking about stuff that just does not work as advertised. For the time being, I'm gonna keep the company's name out of this. I wanna give them a chance to fix the situation before I besmirch them. But this godforsaken teleprompter has been an itch in my ass crack since the day it arrived. Everything from getting into the box to trying to decipher the ridiculous user manual has been a sharp stone in my shoe since the moment it delivered. Entertainment is an up and down business and in the times when I'm not cash poor, this kind of stuff kind of rolls off my back. But in the down times, <laughs> as I've discussed before, I do not buy cheap gear. And I did not buy this particular piece of gear on its price. I bought it because there have been some good reviews and it's from a well-known reputable brand. I've also mentioned that I'm a serial researcher. I watch reviews online, I read customer reviews, most of the time I actually dig down into the customer comments. And in this case, I did what I consider to be due diligence and I bought it. This model is designed to work with any iPad. 
So I made sure that my iPad was up to date with system software, that it was fully charged. I even bought one of those cool little USB power banks to keep it charged while filming. For those of you who don't know, a teleprompter works by allowing you to film through a piece of glass, which is reflecting scrolling text. Because it's right in front of the lens, the person on camera can look right at the viewer and not have to look off to the side or above or what have you. You type your copy in reversed, it reflects on the glass and blip blop bloop. You fool everyone into thinking that you're naturally witty and amazing at memorizing dialogue. So everything's ready. Let's hook this little bastard up and teleprompt the hell out of it. Okay. Here's the deal, people. No, it does not work with any iPad. It only works with iPad minis. A fact that's spelled out in the product description exactly zero times. Zero point zero. It even has pictures of a full-size iPad hooked up to it. But it only works with minis. <sighs> okay, no problem, shame on me. I probably should have delved a little deeper into the research. Maybe it was mentioned there. I happen to have an iPad mini. I got one for free when I signed up for some mega cell phone package horseshit. I don't know, but I have one. So I charged little Winky up, made sure the software was up to date, looked everywhere for my password, changed my fucking password, and I was all ready to go. Not so fast, fatty. Though the device was relatively easy to set up, they left out one tiny detail from their 20 page, eight point type, buy me some reading glasses, pamphlet manual. The iPad goes to sleep after two minutes, regardless of your iPad settings. Now, what fucking good is a teleprompter that needs to be awakened every two minutes? Teleprompters are made for long chunks of copy. <laughs> That's what they're designed for. If it were a couple lines of dialogue, it's not a big deal. I mean, for Christ's sake, I have full episodes of Gilligan's Island memorized from when I was a kid. So if I can't memorize one or two lines of copy, I probably shouldn't be on camera in the first place. And some would argue that I shouldn't. Teleprompters are made for long blocks of copy. They can't go to sleep after two minutes, you idiots. Drop dead, you old fart. See this ball? This ball is mine now. Yeah, I'm keeping it. Go to hell, old man! So take some advice from your old pal, Fatty McButterpants. Do excessive research. Read everything. Ask questions of other buyers. Dig deep. If you think you've done enough research on any piece of gear, do 50% more. Otherwise, like me, you'll be stuck with a teleprompter that doesn't f***ing teleprompt. And if you're a manufacturer who makes these type of things, come here, I wanna tell you something. Listen, stop it. Just stop it, it is nuz. Lastly, I wanna thank a few people that helped me put this show together. My really good friends at The Garden Creative, thanks so much for your support, I really appreciate it. My great friend, Buzz Burbank, for lending his golden throat to the project. Thanks, JR. My wonderful, supportive wife for letting me take over the house to film. Are we about done with this? And my pride and joy. Oh, is it This house so sucks, and also I need money. I also keep forgetting to thank my brother from another mother, Billy Lincoln, for providing the insanely great music for my videos. Also be on the lookout for one of my upcoming episodes where I'll be filming with the vintage lens. And if you can guess the make and model exactly, you win that lens. So stay tuned for that. If you dig the show, please like and subscribe. Hope you enjoyed Hollywood Grump. Until next time, get off my goddamn lawn!